our topic is why are religious people sometimes so sectarian and is it better to be spiritual not religious so we'll discuss based on 518 in the bhagavad gita that is our next slide that is vidya vinaya sampanne brahmane gavi hastini shuni chaiva shvapake cha panditah samadarshinah so samadarshinah samadarshinah is to see equally and panditah so what happens over here is the wise people the panditas they see everyone equally and this equality applies not just to to all human beings but to all living beings and this verse talks about a whole spectrum of humanity now in we will be discussing later the concept of the three modes when we come to the uh, appropriate section but broadly the three modes convey the mentality or the uh, <coughs> disposition of people so vidya vinaya sampanne one who is learned and humble that kind of a wise brahmana spiritual intellectual gavi hastini uh, vidya gavi hastini is a elephant and um, cow shuni chai vashwapake cha and a dog and a dog eater now often people especially in the vedic context are classified according to what they consider as consumable edible so shwapaka is considered to be a person who doesn't have much discrimination in what is to be eaten it's a, as if the word literal translation is a dog eater so basically all human beings from those who would be considered the most evolved to those who are considered least evolved a brahmana and a, and a indiscriminate consumer of animal flesh basically the idea is that there is equal vision pandita samadarshinah now it's interesting that while the statement about equal vision is made it is also there is also a factual there is also a an acceptance or acknowledgement of a of functional vision functional vision means that yes that this particular living being is a dog this particular living being is an elephant this particular living being is a cow this particular human being is from is from this kind of social social categorization so the there is a functional identification also that is there but beyond that there is a spiritual vision of samadarshinah now how how are all living being equal because everybody is a part of a, is everybody is essentially spiritual everybody beyond their bodily coverings is a soul so in that sense because everybody is a soul and all souls are essentially equal just the level of consciousness of the soul varies from person to person so in that sense there is difference but otherwise there is equality so this understanding is vital for for gaining clarity so let's move on to the next slide we'll what we will be discussing about what causes uh, what causes the kind of sectarianism or discrimination that to come up so basically for functioning in any aspect of life uh, there is a combination of hierarchy and equality uh, uh, suppose say a plane is to be flown from say new york to la now we could say okay all passengers are equal well not exactly you know right in the beginning the announcement comes that everybody should follow the instructions of the crew and the crew follows the instructions of the captain so if everybody in an airplane were said to be equal then could any passenger go and sit on the 
uh, and the captain's seat or could anyone just take a charge of the airplane practically piloting it or overall directing it no there is a hierarchy required so in every aspect of life we see hierarchy say for example uh, <clears throat> during uh, if you are driving on a road then the traffic cops they are at a higher hierarchy and if they tell that you have to stop or you are speeding you get a ticket then they get people get a ticket so now at one level nothing will function without hierarchy so even at home if we say uh, yeah everybody is equal fine but then if if there is some food to be cooked well somebody might know cooking another person might be no 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 cooking at all so even if everybody is pitching in to cook it might be better that uh, those so a person who knows how to cook take the lead and direct everyone else so for functioning effectively hierarchies are essential because different people have different degrees of competence but at the, at the same time you know equality is also needed say for example if we are seated and the staff serves everyone but doesn't serve some people and then why are they not served now maybe it's because of their race maybe it's because of something then that will be discrimination and that would be unfair if people from a um, if some people are given more tickets than others that would be considered discriminatory if food is cooked but some people are not given food that would be considered discriminatory so equality has to be there so we could say that there are, has to be hierarchy in terms of uh, of authority for deciding but at the same time there has to be equality in terms of opportunity so let's move forward so without hierarchy what happens uh, see if there is only emphasis on hierarchy there is over emphasis that can lead to tyranny so where we have tyrannical governments we have tyrannical leaders where they i is yes, i am the boss and that's why you have to obey me now if there is only emphasis on hierarchy without consideration of competence then that can become tyrannical and we in the modern modern society we have most of the modern world we have um, democratic government which basically holds that people elect who will be the leader so generally if a person is a king who has inherited the kingdom there is a certain amount of suspiciousness that this person might be tyrannical so there is over emphasis on hierarchy that leads to tyranny on the other hand if there is over emphasis on equality that leads to anarchy why anarchy because like we discussed if uh, every if it is said that anybody can drive a plane well that won't work because different people have different degrees of competence sorry so then what is the solution there is has to be a balance of hierarchy and uh, tyranny so now yeah go ahead now how does this apply in our in the spiritual context so the word religious has now acquired a certain negative connotation and that's why many people want to be religious but not spiritual so in general what happens is religious people emphasize hierarchy over equality so for example if within a within a religious structure say if somebody goes to a temple or somebody goes to a church and say certain certain say aarti is being performed certain sacraments are being performed then the performer of the sacrifice who may be showers sprinkle sacred water on others that person is uh, is considered at a purer level now at a function at a practical level maybe they they are they follow higher standards of cleanliness and hygiene also there maybe they take a bath and they purify themselves physically but the idea is that for performing any kind of specific ceremonies practices rituals which especially involve a mass of people there is a hierarchy involved and this hierarchy is what is emphasized 
by religious people so there could be people in positions of authority it could be as i said a rich, ritual authority could be there where certain rituals are being performed and certain people are directing it there could be institutional authority where there are where there are there are some institutional structures and there are certain people in power within those institutional structures so when hierarchy is emphasized over equality that sort of that sort of attitude is common among religious people on the other hand among spiritual people there is an emphasis on equality over hierarchy so equality over hierarchy means yes everybody is equal everybody is essentially uh, everybody is essentially it's a egalitarian attitude is there so naturally we might we might gravitate toward the spiritual way of looking at things oh and everybody should be considered equal yes that is true but spirituality is also a process for growth in one of our earlier sessions we had discussed about how spiritual and material are levels of consciousness and it's like going up a mountain so that the bottom of the mountain is material consciousness the top of the mountain is spiritual consciousness and we need to rise from material consciousness to spiritual consciousness and to so the to go up the mountain there can be different paths now somebody might be more experienced in climbing up a mountain somebody might be situated already higher and they can see better and they can tell us okay go this way don't go that way so from a functional perspective there could be people who who need to guide the mountain the mountain climbing expedition and there has to be some amount of authority now ideally speaking the authority has to be based on competence now religion although the word has a negative connotation religion essentially means the path by which somebody can go up from material consciousness to spiritual consciousness and different people can have different religions in terms of what they follow specifically but essentially there is a path to be followed and following for following the path a certain structure of authority a certain hierarchy will be required and that ideally speaking the authority should be the hierarchy should be based on competence that means those who are on top of the mountain should be spiritually more evolved they should be more they should be wiser they should be more realized and then they can guide the the rising for the, the rising to spiritual consciousness for others so when there is this understanding of of a balanced sort of understanding that there is spiritual and there is religious so <coughs> religious people just focus on yeah i am at a higher position you are at a lower position offer your respects to me well okay there some amount of respects have to be may be offered but the idea is everybody is equal in the sense that everybody has the potential to rise to the top and everybody needs to be given the potential the opportunity to rise to the top now of course we are not going into so much into religious sectarianism over here because we discussed that earlier how there can be different paths up the mountain and some people might claim that my path is the only path up the mountain and we discussed about exclusivism inclusivism and pluralism earlier exclusivism is my path is the only path pluralism is all paths are right and inclusivism is there's one purpose and many paths with that are included within that purpose so the purpose is to go up the mountain and different paths might take us to the top of the mountain so we will see how religious but spiritual can be can religious but not spiritual misapplication can happen among various cultures across the world india has probably the a, a spiritual wisdom tradition that asserts universal equality that whether it is the imper the advaitic or dvaitic tradition that says that essentially we are all atma now what is the relation of the atma or the parmatma that might be a matter of difference but the point is that universal equality is very strongly asserted as a philosophical truth and yet india is also characterized by social structure that imposes severe discrimination and that is the caste system so we see that how, how do how do we bring about a cognitive that this can lead to a cognitive dissonance 
kind of philosophically you say everyone are equal but uh, practically society was so stratified that certain people were considered untouchable that you cannot even if you come to the, this area and if you touch this water well water then you will be punished or some people were treated very very strongly discriminated against so what happened over here so why did why is the philosophy the philosophical truths not play out and will were not demonstrated in the real life so again going back to the uh, if we want to consider uh, the hierarchy and uh, equality principle we can look at it in the pand pendulum now at one extreme would be ritualism where externals alone matter that is this is the hierarchy and this is what is right that is what is wrong externals alone matter the other extreme is sentimentalism where externals don't matter at all and what the gita says and what many spiritual traditions across the world say is that externals are ways to the internals Now, there are certain spirituality is not just a state of mind it is a level of consciousness to be attained by doing something at a practical level and that doing something at a practical level is the essence of um, is the essence of mm, the spiritual growth so the externals matter just like we can't sentimentally say oh the bottom of the mountain and the top of the mountain are equal or somebody is at the bottom and somebody at the top of the mountain are equal no everybody has equal spiritual potential everybody can rise to the top but they actually have to go through the journey to rise to the top so now when ritualism is ex emphasized as happened in the caste system can you go ahead next slide so what was the cause of the irony that without an emphasis on education about the purpose of the hierarchy purpose here was the purpose of the hierarchy and the purpose of the entire structure ultimately the external is seen as essential and in the case of the caste system the external thing was the birth okay uh, which particular dynasty which particular caste you were born in that became seen as essential so when you talk in terms of the bottom and the top of the mountain it seems very simple yeah everybody has to go to the top and there can be a hierarchy needed so that people will guide about how to go to the top but this often takes a long long time the spiritual spiritual journey and because the bottom and the top are not so clearly visible so what happens is that the since the ultimate purpose is sometimes overlooked and the hierarchies become are seen not as functional but the hierarchies themselves are seen as foundational or mm, the central and then what happens then oh i am here i need to be respected and you are down there and you need to will be reviled so that's what happened can you go to the next slide that happened in the caste system that it was meant for cooperation but it became a tool for discrimination now there can be now it is not just within the indian tradition that this kind of discrimination happens anywhere across the world if you go hierarchies are often created and that leads to discrimination so even when the british came to india they thought that we white people are very progressed you know not just white people it was specifically white men because <clears throat> till the start of the 20th century no no please stay back till the start of the uh, till the start of the 20th century especially in second world before the world wars it was men who were in central positions of authority now it was not that men were exploiting women men and women were meant to women were meant to cooperate to to function as a family unit and as a social unit with the family being the fundamental social unit but what happened was that wherever the in is a hierarchy there is a tendency to go toward tyranny and when that happens then the hierarchy is uh, needs to be challenged and it needs to be curtailed so the caste system the brahmana started claiming that we are superior because we are born in a higher caste so, uh, so then similarly it happens to some extent toward the kshatriyas also so people's essential and lifelong identity became their birth rather than it giving a functional place the four varanas 
ब्राह्मण क्षत्रिय वैश्य शूद्र दे आर मेंट एसेंशियली फॉर सोशल कोऑपरेशन सो दैट एवरीबडी कैन कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट अकॉर्डिंग टू द नेचुरल इंक्लिनेशन एंड नेचुरल एंडोमेंट सो इट्स बेसिकली दर इज सम पीपल विल प्ले अ मिनिस्टेरियल रोल सम पीपल विल प्ले अजी मैनेजियर रोल सम पीपल विल प्ले अ मकेंटाइल रोल एंड सम पीपल विल प्ले अ मोर मैकेनिकल रोल लाइक एन आर्टिसन and all of these are important as a social limb we'll talk more about the how the caste system contributes to spiritual growth when we come later to the appropriate section of varnashram but here our point is something different the point is to take the caste system as an example of how within a spiritual context sectarianism discrimination tyranny can come up they come up when there is a over emphasis on externals as compared to the internals can we go ahead yeah so here is a four quadrant diagram on the x axis is religious y axis is spiritual and if we see if the people are not religious not spiritual then they will be materialistic if people are religious but not spiritual then they are ritualistic they just do a particular thing and that's all that they do if somebody thinks like that i am spiritual but not religious now in terms of sentiment it's a good sentiment but i don't want any discrimination but it can lead to people becoming sentimental just like yeah everybody can cook in the kitchen yeah everybody can cook but that doesn't mean everybody is equally good in the kitchen and if you want good food not that everybody can cook everybody will be equally able to produce good food so yes everybody is essentially spiritual but we all need some guidance about how to grow spiritually and they that has to be based on where somebody is presently in terms of their spiritual growth so sentimental refers to where the hierarchy is where the hierarchy is completely rejected and spiritual but not so then the people are spiritual but not religious so if spiritual but not religious means that i am not narrow minded i am open minded i don't think my path is the only right path that is fine so today the word spiritual is used in a more positive sense and religious is used in a negative sense but this sense is quite recent even 50 60 years ago einstein said that you know the deepest appreciation of the universe when we see the harmony and um, intricacy of nature is a religious appreciation of the universe so when he talked about religious he used that in the sense of a spiritual the or he used it in the same positive sense in which we use the word spiritual today so <clears throat> the idea over here is that when there is a openness to some higher or deeper truths in life that when there is a openness and a eagerness to explore what lies beyond what is just apparent that is what is called as spiritual and originally religious was meant to take us toward that non material reality toward ultimately the ultimate non material reality that is god so now if we had there has to be transformational growth there has to be a combination of religious and spiritual so we need to be we need to be religiously spiritual religiously spiritual means that when we are trying to climb up a mountain we need to religiously diligently follow the path which will take us up the mountain but while we are following that path we also need to recognize that there is a purpose for this path and it is not just adherence to this path that will take us up it is or adherence to this path alone will take us up there are different paths and different people can go up by the particular path that they are following so that is that will be transformational <clears throat> so there has to be the both religious and spiritual combined together we need to be you could call it religiously spiritual or spiritually religious but the idea is there has to be a combination of both <clears throat> if there is to be growth so now 
this can play out in today's world in various ways and <clears throat> we this a whole idea of sectarianism comes when there is a hierarchy emphasized now the hierarchy might play a purpose I might serve a purpose at a particular level but if the purpose of the hierarchy is forgotten then the hierarchy needs to be uh, to be relegated to a lower place the hierarchy shouldn't be emphasized and in fact we could say the bhagavatam which talks about bhakti uh, bhakti quite vividly through various examples the bhagavatam is a remarkably subversive book subversive means that the traditional structures of hierarchy are repeatedly subverted for the process of our emphasizing the importance of bhakti okay, i have a whole class on this that time and time again if we consider almost every significant past time in the bhagavatam is about the subversion of religious structures so now narsimha chaturdashi is going to come soon so the defining character of narsimha chaturdashi is the exemplary devotion of prahlad normally there is a cosmic hierarchy there are godly beings and there are demo, there are ungodly or demoniac beings and the godly are considered to be higher than the ungodly the divine are considered higher than the demoniac the prahlad is born in a demoniac family but he by his devotion supersedes even the best of the divine beings even the greatest of the gods so there will be normal hierarchy divine and demoniac but there is subversion of the authority subversion of the hierarchy because there is the essential principle of devotion so like that every past time in the bhagavatam involves a subversion of every major past time which is some kind of subversion of authority where the hierarchy is subordinated to bhakti somebody might be at a higher level in fact the brahmanas are considered normally the highest in the social hierarchy and sanyasis are considered again highest among the ashram hierarchy but we have the past time of ambarish maharaj and durvasa where durvasa is a brahmana and a sanyasi but he become he is unfortunately not very spiritual he is short tempered and judgmental and he gets angry when he sees that the when he has come to the house of ambarish maharaj who is hosting him that ambarish maharaj is eating before him and he becomes enraged and he tries to he tries to punish parikshit ambarish maharaj and when he tries to almost attack and assassinate ambarish maharaj out of his anger then what happens is it is he who becomes the target of the lord's anger the sudarshan chakra comes and starts chasing him and eventually he has to come and beg forgiveness not from the lord but from ambrish maharaj as the person whom he had offended so what happens is the hierarchy is inverted uh, sanyasi brahmana has to uh, seek forgiveness from a brahmana from a from a from a kshatriya grahastha so the idea is hierarchy is get inverted probably the uh, a viv more vivid past time which demonstrates the inversion of hierarchy in terms of rituals is the past time on krishna leela in the 10th canto which talks about the brahmanas who were performing yagya they are called the yagik brahmanas and their wives so these brahmanas were performing a magnificent sacrifice and elaborate ritual arrangements had been made and they had been doing it with great expertise and at that time krishna was playing nearby in the in the forest he was grazing his cows and playing with his friends and he they felt hungry so they decided krishna told that go to the brahmanas they have lots of food available over there they can give us some food but the brahmanas were so caught in their rituals and they just they were so disdainful about everybody they we are doing these rituals don't disturb us so they paid no attention at all to krishna's friends although they said that actually it's not that we need want food it's krishna who wants food but still they didn't pay any attention at all and later on krishna told the his coward friends that you go to the wives of the brahmanas now when the when they went to the wives of the brahmana they heard krishna is krishna is here and krishna wants food they immediately took 
the best of the food that they had cooked for the sacrifice and they took it and went to Krishna. Now, the purpose of the rituals was to ultimately please the gods and among the gods the highest is Krishna. So it is ultimately to please Krishna. Krishna is Ahami Sarva Yajnanam Bhokta Cha Prabhurevacha that he is the ultimate purpose, the master and the enjoyer of all sacrifices. But unfortunately, they did not understand this. So they emphasized the ritual so much that they forgot the purpose of the ritual. So it was spiritual, they were religious but not spiritual. They were religious, the Brahmanas were religious but not spiritual. Now on the other hand, the Brahman Patnis their wives, they were, were assisting their husbands in the performance of the ritual. So they did not reject the rituals. In fact, they had cooked, the purpose of, cooked that elaborate feast and they had made various arrangements. So it was not an indiscriminate rejection or, uh, or indiscriminate or blanket rejection of all rituals. That is what happens when they are spiritual but not religious. However, there are times when what is conventionally considered to be religious actually comes in the way of being spiritual. So, in a normal functional way, we follow the religious path to become spiritual. But sometimes what is considered as religious becomes so ritualistic and fossilized that it doesn't actually raise one to a higher consciousness. It doesn't, pers it per it doesn't lead to the uh, spiritual growth. Then that may have to be given up. So, this is an example of where the Yagik Brahman Patnis, they might not be that expert in religious rituals, but they were they were very very well grounded about the spiritual purpose. So that has to be, that's the example of how hierarchy is sometimes, uh, it, it can be misleading and that's why the purpose has to be kept in mind. Can we go ahead? So the solution to avoid hierarchy is mm, that we need to uh, to avoid tyranny or avoid any kind of tyranny or any kind of uh, uh, sectarianism judgmentality uh, is that we have to function according to hierarchy but we keep equality in mind that means we remember that everyone is essentially uh, everyone essentially equal in terms of everybody's has equal spiritual potential and we don't let the hierarchy become the sole defining basis of functioning. If we let that hierarchy, be hierarchy become the sole defining basis, then that leads to problems. That can lead to discrimination and sectarianism. Yeah, go ahead. So we harmonize hierarchy and equality by focusing on spiritual growth. So what will lead us and others to higher consciousness? If we keep that in mind, then we all can grow harmoniously, uh, grow steadily. And ultimately, we all can realize our spiritual potentials. We all can reach the top of the mountain. So I'll summarize what I spoke and then we can have questions. I spoke on this topic of <clears throat> that why are sometimes religious people sectarian and is it better to be spiritual but not religious. So I spoke about sectarian here in terms of mm, that those who are in authority they consider themselves to be elite and special and they push everybody else down and people who belong to a particular path they think we are special just because we are belonging to the path without considering their position. So the essential idea was that that there has to be for any kind of effective functioning there has to be a hierarchy but the hierarchy is to be based on competence just like while driving or cooking or flying an airplane now, if there is no hierarchy that can lead to anarchy but if there is only emphasis on hierarchy and there is no acknowledgement of equality that can lead to tyranny so there is a balance of both and then I discussed about the pendulum that one extreme is that the externals, in externals in terms of the, in a spiritual path, why are, uh, why is the hierarchy needed? Because there are rituals to be performed 
and there is a, there is doctrinal or philosophical education to be imparted so there is the philosophical understanding and there is the practical performance of things and for both of these there might be some people who might be more competent than others and ideally these people should be more spiritually evolved so the hierarchy is essential so that the practical processes of spiritual growth are followed properly and the understanding of the overall nature of reality is imparted systematically so the but when that is lacking and some people just claim entitlement claim to be in a higher position because of just being in a higher position then that leads to uh, that leads to narrow mindedness that leads to uh, discrimination so the we discussed the caste system as an example of how things go can go wrong and although the indian thought traditions emphasize equality of all living beings at a spiritual level socially there has been the one of the severest systems of hierarchy that led to great discrimination that is the caste system so that happened because if there is not adequate emphasis on education then the external is seen as essential so we discussed about the pyram about the pendulum to think of the external alone to be essential that is ritualism to consider the external doesn't matter at all the practices or the uh, clarity of philosophical understanding that doesn't matter at all that is sentimentalism so the balance state is that we use the externals as means to as it is a means to uh, grow spiritually if we see it that way then there is a proper balance then we talk about four quadrants again if there is neither spiritual nor religious then the person is simply materialistic and then there is no concept of spiritual growth or possibility for spiritual growth but if there is only emphasis on the spirit and the hierarchy and not on the uh, <clears throat> if there is emphasis on being spiritual but not religious that can lead to sentimentalism because <clears throat> it's like saying no hierarchy is needed because there is no no tangible path of progress then i discussed about how there is <clears throat> there can be religious but not spiritual where external is alone i emphasize that ritualism or sentimentalism and we want to go toward the transformational where there is both spiritual and religious so how do we harmonize this that is by we acknowledge equality we acknowledge equality in principle and we adopt the hierarchy that helps us to grow spiritually so by focusing on the purpose of spiritual growth we all can advance steadily okay so now the questions are here first question what is the effect of sentimentality and its and its effects so pure sentimentality was awarded in the case of the brahmana wives well words have different connotations so sentiment is healthy we all want to have spiritual sentiments we all want to have love for krishna but sentimentality means that emotions alone are the are the deciders of all our actions we have not nothing else to consider at all now when the brahman patnis the wives of the brahmanas went to krishna were they driven by sentiment yes they were driven by deep devotion for krishna but at the same time when they offered prayers to krishna and when krishna gave them philosophical instructions uh, about how they should continue their varana, their social duties while at the same time worshiping him inside the heart they accepted that so they were not philosophically ignorant they might not be philosophically as maybe as savvy as their husbands but that doesn't mean that they were philosophically ignorant so sentimentality means sentiment alone is the sole driving factor deciding factor in one's uh, one's life so some sentimentality could mean that if somebody says that oh last night i had a dream about krishna and because i dreamt about krishna krishna himself came in my dream therefore that means my life is already perfected 
how many of you you wake up, you do all the sadhana business how many of you have krishna coming in your dream you don't have krishna coming in your dream so you are not spiritually advanced well if krishna comes in somebody's dream that's wonderful but you know, it is ultimately our relationship is with krishna is based on not how he comes in our dreams or not it is based on how we serve him in our wakeful state because we exercise our free will to move towards him so sentimentalism means that based on certain based on certain parameters which we decide are absolutely important we claim that i alone am the highest so we might for example be a, we might we we discuss the principle of guru so each spiritual master each, each all all devotees are should be inspired by their spiritual master but if somebody starts thinking my spiritual master is the is the greatest spiritual master and if you don't follow my spiritual master then you are not going to go grow spiritually well yes with the spiritual master we should have deep devotion and uh, respect for them but, but at the same time we have to understand that krishna can manifest through different spiritual masters for different people so we can form sectarianism within our movement based on this is my spiritual master and that is your spiritual master and there is and you have to follow my spiritual master only only my spiritual master is a pure devotee your spiritual master is not a pure devotee how are we to know that so sentimentalism means that we instead of giving sentiments the due place we make them the sole deciders that's how sentimentality can lead to uh, things being misled so can you explain four quadrants with examples well the first quadrant is self explanatory that if somebody says there is nothing more to life say for example you know carl sagan he had this famous uh, tv series called cosmos now right in the beginning he says the cosmos was all that ever had that existed all that exists and all that will ever exist ever exist now this is an ideological claim and nowhere in his series in his, in the cosmos does he establish this as a fact uh it does not give any scientific reasoning it's a presumption science functions on the presumption that it's called methodological naturalism that nature that nature is all that exists that's a that's a assumption that's a presumption based on which science functions but when the presumption is portrayed as a conclusion um, that is misleading so somebody who claims that there is nothing beyond the material and some people claim that all religious rituals are just hocus pocus then so metaphysically as well as practically there is no acceptance of any reality higher than the material that would be a person who is neither spiritual nor religious so somebody is religious but not spiritual that means they emphasize religious they emphasize rituals or practices so much that they overlook everything else so for example say we fast on certain sacred days we fast on ekadashi and we avoid certain foods on ekadashi now even uh, other spiritual traditions they might not fast on ekadashi they might say in other religions they might they might be following some kind of fasting on some other days or even in some other indian traditions some other bhakti traditions also they might fast on ekadashi but they might not fast from the same foods that we fast from so if we are fasting from a particular food and others are not fasting somebody says you know oh, you're not fasting from this food or you're not fasting on this day therefore uh, you you are you are disqualified you are not following things properly well that would be an example of religious but not spiritual there can be many examples which we can go further Uh, and talk about how sectarianism can become can blind people's vision you know once there was a catholic nun who, who who was looking after a orphanage for young girls and as she was talking with a girl who had come to teenage and was growing up he says when you grow up what do you want to do she says she said i want to become a prostitute what oh oh what did you say I said i want to become a prostitute <sighs> thank god i thought you said i want to become a protestant so here somebody might 
become so fanatical about catholicism is the only right way that even in christianity the other division that is the catholics and protestants protestants might be considered worse than worse than say in this case uh, people who sell their bodies for for profit so the idea is that sectarianism can blind us completely so religious but not spiritual is sectarian spiritual but not religious what it means is that somebody doesn't consider any path to be important at all so somebody just says that you know yeah i want to be spiritual and you know when i sit down and i i i just think deeply about life i feel spiritual well that's good if you feel spiritual but there is a process for going deeper into spirituality so when there is when there is complete down playing playing of any any metaphysical understanding or or any any disciplined practice for growing spiritually we will talk later in the in the about this see basically spirituality has two aspects to it it can be called as doxy and praxy doxy refers to like we have the word orthodoxy and we can also have word orthopraxy so praxy is practice doxy is doctrine so there is a intellectual or a philosophical aspect to spirituality and there is a ritual or practitioner's aspect in spiritual growth so we need to evolve in our intellectual understanding and we need to evolve in our practices so and both are meant to help us through philosophical analysis and through the the practices we are meant to get a clearer understanding and deeper experience of spiritual realities or which are meant to rise to the top of the mountain but if that doesn't happen that me or not only that doesn't happen that is that metaphysical understanding needs to un, needs to deepen or we need to practice processes in such a way that we rise to a higher consciousness these both are, are the doxy and the praxy are com, are so minimized that it there is no there is no acknowledgement given to them at all then that is uh, somebody is being spiritual but not religious and that could be unhealthy is uh, then spiritual and religious means that somebody acknowledges that this is the path i want to follow at the same time they also acknowledge that this is what i uh, this is the path i am following and i'll follow diligently but there can be others who may follow other paths and they will also grow spiritually by following their paths so when there is that acknowledgement then there is both the balance of the praxy and the doxy together so that is spiritual and religious so the next question what difference between spirituality and religion i already answered that yes the king, the story of king ambarish comes in the ninth canto of the shrimad bhagavatam how do we measure our spiritual growth broadly by two things bhakti paresha anubhav virakti ranyatra cha when we practice bhakti or a spiritual process for uh, for growing then para ish anubhav we experience transcendence and that experience of transcendence is so enriching so fulfilling that we want to experience it more and more so attraction to increased attraction or attachment to the spiritual and therefore uh, once we start experiencing that virakti ranyatra cha we don't crave for other experiences so sensual experiences the craving for them goes down so spiritual attachment and material attachment are two essential practices for uh, two essential characteristics for and sensing that we are going spiritually yes yeah, so while doing sadhana bhakti if our attraction to krishna is increasing then we are growing and if our of our capacity to resist sensual pleasures that is gradually increasing that is also an indicator of spiritual growth Mm. so are there any other questions related with the specific topic <clears throat> the question that parikshit maharaj and parikshit maharaj story is told differently in the mahabharat and the bhagavatam that's because these stories they occur in different 
cosmic cycles and they may occur slightly differently in different cosmic cycles so each book has its particular purpose and based on that purpose uh, uh, the narrative is told accordingly so for example if we consider the mahabharat its primarily primary purpose is to demonstrate how there is gradual spiritual that there is gradual growth where somebody lose follows dharma and then attains swarga thereafter so the, but, but the mahabharat we could say is a much more activist kind of book where there is a it the emphasis is on this world so naturally when parishit maharaj is threatened to is threatened by a curse which is patently unfair then parishit maharaj tries to resist that so so his uh, soldier is courtier soldiers they make an arrangement by which he goes and stays on top of a mountain and in an enclosed structure to protect himself and then a brahmana comes to see him and the brahmana offers him a fruit toward the end of the seventh day and when parishit maharaj accepts the fruit and is about to eat it from that snake from that fruit uh uh a snake like being emerges and it bites parikshit maharaj and he dies so the bhagavatam tells the story that parikshit maharaj renounces the world and goes to the forest and sits down for 7 days and here's the bhagavatam and then a snake bird comes and bites him and then he dies so the idea over here is that depending on what kind of role one is playing in society one may adopt a different approach when faced with difficulties so for example if some devotee gets cancer now what should they do should that devotee okay this cancer is god's will so let me just accept that i'm going to die now and focus focus on spiritual growth well that's one approach and that's fine if the if the devotee is already old and body is sickly and there is uh, the chances of recovery are high then that's okay but if somebody feels that no uh, i still have young i have a lot of service to do then then it is important that uh, that we try to cure and some devotees might try to try very vigorously try this treatment try this treat, try that try that do this go travel here and that's also fine so the key thing here is uh, what is the consciousness what is the intent so parikshit maharaj even when he he strives to protect himself his purpose is that he is the he is he is the protector of dharma and as long as the king is safe then the king can protect dharma if the king is king is uh, king is uh, destroyed then dharma can be destroyed so it's the consciousness that is important if we see the body as a tool given by krishna and that's why we want to dr- diligently protect it Then that is fine, so that we can grow spiritually. We try to protect the body as a tool. Or if you feel that okay, this body is one tool, it is already, it is already deteriorating now. So let me just focus on spiritual growth. And if Krishna wants me to further grow spiritually before I come to him, then he will give me another tool. So there can be different approaches to spiritual growth, and the two different approaches to spiritual growth. Uh, are signified by the two different narratives in the bhag mahabharat and the shrimad bhagavatam so one last question the two questions but uh, so uh, about the caste system i will uh, talk about more in a future session but quickly i'll answer over here that how is the principle of equality seen when there is a discrimination against uh, karana and eklavya well karana is a complicated subject now eklavya was definitely talented but there is the guna karma vibhaga shah one has to have the competence in terms of how to do some things but one has to have also have the character to be able to use that power properly so eklavya actually 
belonged to a insurgent group of people called the Nishadhas and they were repeatedly disrupting the Kuru administration and that was the reason why Eklavya was not taught by Drona. Now it was Drona, it was Eklavya, oh, Eklavya was a student from that Nishada dynasty and he wanted to learn from Drona and Drona refused. The Drona's refusal was not just because he belonged to a non Kshatriya caste, but it is also because he belonged to a particular group of people who was act, who were actively uh, who were actively working against the Kauravas, uh, Kauravas and Drona's, Acad Drona's academy had been founded by the Kurus by the Kuru dynasty and thus those who were disrupting he didn't want to take them and eventually it happens that uh, <coughs> Eklavya he learns his skills but then he joins Jarasandha and uh, and later on when Krishna attacks Jarasandha in that fight in that fight between Krishna and uh, Jarasandha, Jarasandha's forces one of the fights then Eklavya is killed by Krishna that's a story that is mentioned briefly in the Mahabharata so the idea is now Eklavya went and sided with a demoniac king who was actively working against who was actively fighting against Krishna and supporting other demoniac rulers consolidating various demoniac rulers so that itself reflected his demoniac tendency so Eklavya was deprived not so much because of his belonging to a particular caste but because he also had a particular disposition and that was seen through his actions about Karana we can discuss in a separate session later but the essential principle is that yes there was discrimination but Karana also did make some mistakes and uh, if you consider one principle that Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that Sakale Neha Mahata Yoga Parantapa we discussed this earlier that Krishna is saying by the power of time the 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 original system for spiritual growth the dharma the you that has become that that dec, has become declined that has declined now krishna that in that sense krishna is talking about the time when he is present that presently dharma has declined and therefore i have come to teach the principles of the bhagavad gita i have come to establish dharma so the idea is the now krishna is talking about his times and his times are the time when the mahabharat is when the Mahabharata is happening. So Krishna is saying that the society as reflected in the Mahabharata is not an ideal society. It is a society that has deviated from the ideals and in that sense there was some discrimination even at that time. Although there was an acknowledgement that essentially a person's characteristic has to, person's uh, varana has to be defined by their qualities, by their behavior. But fun functionally the system had become somewhat uh, rigid and solidified, rigid and stratified and that Krishna says is unhealthy and he had come to correct that. So was there a system for ensuring flexibility uh, for people who would be from one varana to rise to a higher varana? It depends on the, the wisdom of the leaders. The, if the leaders are sufficiently spiritually aware then they will see beyond the externals and they will focus on the essentials and that's how they will give opportunity for people to advance so there is in the Upanishad the famous story of Satyakama Jabali of how although he was born in a lower caste but he was given he was acknowledged as a Brahmana because he was very truthful similarly Narad Muni was born to a maid servant and his, his father was also not known um, but uh, he was uh, but still he was considered to be such a great sage that even even the greatest of gods they respect him profoundly so there were of there are exception there are cases of people who were exceptions and who did rise above the hierarchy despite being born in lower hierarchy and the Bhagavatam itself describes devotees many many devotees who rise above the hierarchy so Parikshit Maharaj was born and then revived by Krishna well was still born well 
Vishwanath Gadakur also in his commentary says that Ashwatthama's Astra, Ashwatthama had attacked uh, Uttara's womb and Parikshit had died because of that, but Krishna revived him. So exactly that may not be talked about, that may not be mentioned in the Bhagavatam. So the idea is that it could be the, the Bhagavatam says that he saw Krishna and he saw Krishna defending him and thus uh, he was attracted and he was constantly searching for Krishna. Para Ikshita. With his eyes he was looking for that other person who had saved him. And that's how he, he was very devoted to Krishna. That's true. So it could be that he was... Uh, that then the Bhagavatam doesn't say he was still born. Not that he came out of the womb and then he was revived. What the Bhagavatam says that... In, or what Chakravarti Path says that... That the, the Astra... The Brahmastra killed Ashwatthama within the womb, but Krishna revived him. Krishna countered the Brahm, revived him and then countered the Brahmastra. And then Parikshit was watching him, watching him, watching him, and he saw that, okay, this is like this. This is the Lord who protected me, and thus he was very devoted to him. So, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Hare Krishna.